Hi, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to our April edition of Show and Tell. Thanks so much for joining us today. If you are new to Show and Tell, we do this the first Wednesday of every month. Uh, it's just a chance for a select few from our creative team globally to come together, share some things that are currently uh, inspiring us, that's currently in our zeitgeist. And we always strive to make some cultural connections as we go. But your job as an attendee is just to sit back, relax, and hopefully come away being inspired after today's webinar. Our next one will be on Wednesday, May 3rd. And as always, we will be sharing today's links and a recording of today's webinar with you later this week. Uh, and of course, you can always find all of our previous webinars and show and tells both on our YouTube channel and on the webcast tab of our website at fashionsloops.com. Before we jump into today's links, I'm actually going to turn it over to our lead of color, Joe, who's going to talk about some really exciting things. First, a little bit of housekeeping. As always, we love to hear from you during the webinar. Please do utilize the chat box. Just make sure that it is uh, selected at everyone so that both panelists and attendees can see what you're responding to, what you love, any questions that you have. Uh, our team will, of course, try to answer them as we go. Joe, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about some great webinars coming up. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, hi, everyone. So as Michael said, I'm Joe Thomas, and I'm the Director of Colour Advisory here at FS. And I'm thrilled to announce our up and coming Colour Week. So kicking off on the 24th of April, we'll be launching three pre-recorded webcasts that will go live on our site at the start of each day. So Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. And we will deep dive into everything you need to know for colour in fall, winter 24-25. So these will all be hosted on the FS platform, so are exclusive to our FS clients. So if you are not currently a client of FS, don't worry, we do have something for you coming up as well. So just to quickly take you through each of um, the sessions. So the first one is our fall, winter 24, 25 color shifts. And this is where we analyze how color is evolving in relation to the global cultural climate. Then on Tuesday, we have our must have anchor color webcasts go live. And this will delve into the hues that are really going to captivate consumers and drive newness for your future assortments. And then on Wednesday, we have our top 10 colors by market. And this will allow you to truly deep dive and gain clarity into what is going to be the most important colors for your specific industry. And as I mentioned before, these will all be available to watch on demand at the start of each of the days. So no need to pre-register for this. So we really hope that this gives you the flexibility to tune in when suits you best within your day and your time zone. Then very excited about this one. To finish off our color week, we are excited to open up what was one of our previously client exclusive webinars to our global community. So all clients and non-clients of FS can join in for our spring summer 25 color preview. So this is a live webinar which is free to attend and you can register by going to fashionsnoops.com forward slash events. So we look forward to seeing you all there. I'll now pass back to Michael to get started with today's show and tell. Thank you, Joe. I'm actually going to uh, stop share. We have a really, really uh, big treat today at the start of show and tell. Uh, one of the friends of FS, uh, Chris Colby, uh, who previously to his most recent endeavor worked for a major retailer here in the US. He's actually here today. He's gonna talk about his new brand, Hypernatural. We are a big fan of it here in our household. I'm actually wearing one of the shirts today. He's gonna talk about what's so amazing about it. Um, we, a few of us met with him uh, a month or so ago. And the reason why we wanted to bring him on to show and tell today is because his approach at sustainability, um, I felt, and I know the team members felt, was just so storytelling centric. And we really were inspired with kind of what he had to say about his new products and, and his approach. So um, I'm actually gonna turn it over to Chris. He's gonna talk for a few minutes about the brand and uh, share screen and show us some things that's going on. Hey, Chris, welcome to Show and Tell. All right, can you guys all hear me? We can. All right, hopefully, uh, can you see me? We can see you. All right. Well, check, check. So nice to meet everyone. So my name is Chris Colby. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Michael. Appreciate that. Um, 
you know, I'm the co-founder of this brand Hypernatural, which we've been in the market now for just over a month. So we're, 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 we're very, very new, but we've been on this journey for a couple of years. And, and so what I'm going to share with you a little bit today is just, you know, my briefly, my personal journey. I've been in the industry for 30 some years. I've worked for Ralph Lauren. I've worked for J. Crew. I started a brand called Original Penguin uh, a while back. And so I've always been in the, in the business, been in retail and merchandising and product. And uh, a couple of years ago, uh, you know, during COVID, a buddy of mine, uh, we kind of started noodling on what would it look like to make the best of something. And as we dug a little bit deeper in, we started thinking a lot more about what the world really needs is, is things that are more sustainable. But what really was some of the biggest issues with sustainable products is they're not that special. They're not that different. And, and ultimately, like they don't really have this commercial benefit often that people really need to be successful. And so we really took approach of, went down to the fabric and the fiber level and started thinking about what would make the most awesome polo shirt in the world so awesome. And so I'm just gonna share with you a little bit of like how Hypernatural came about and what we've turned it into um, that's hitting the market right now. So um, can I share my screen? Let's see. You can, you should be able to. Okay, can everybody, can everybody see the Hypernatural? Uh, nope. There you go, Button. you're good. All right, terrific. Okay, so <clears throat> like I said, Hypernatural was born over a couple of years as a sort of R&D process. And the philosophy that we started to adopt was that we could actually make things better naturally. There was lots of ways, if you really looked at what nature can give you, and particularly working with reclaimed waste from nature, you could actually make products even better than what a normal quote unquote performance product would look like today. And the problem we have in our industry is that, you know, 85% of materials that are made globally now are synthetic. So majority of that is polyester. And obviously that creates a massive problem when, when so much growth in, in our industry is in raw materials that are petroleum based that are non-biodegradable. And ultimately they're just, they're just bad for everybody. They're bad for your skin, they're bad for your health, they're bad for our planet. And so if we really embraced what nature could give us and really made nature awesome, uh, we really wanted to see what that would look like in the form of a fabric. And so as we sort of started out, we, we, we really locked in on the fact that ultimately there has to be benefits for the customer first. And so we had to make the most comfortable product possible. And so what would really go into making it so comfortable and then also, how do you make the best possible product have the, the least amount of impact on our environment? And so that's the, the, the sort of duality we started with. And, and as we got a little bit further into it, we realized that, you know, just comfortable wasn't enough, but actually could you deliver some form of natural performance would be even better, right? So because performance today is synonymous with polyester and chemicals, and really in the end of the day, polyester is the enemy. We have to come up with a better alternative for our future. Uh, there is no roundabout way about it. We just we have to really reduce the amount of polyester and synthetics in our in our industry uh, for all the different reasons that most of you probably already know. But at the end of the day, polyester is cheap. It's easy to buy and you spray chemicals on it and it's quote unquote performance. So we took the approach that we could make it better and we could start to demonstrate to people that hypernatural is really this intersection of nature and science that gets you to something that's altogether different. And so we, we took approach and we, we call these are our ingredients. And with really the approach to the fiber uh, development, we went down literally to the raw fiber level and we figured out a way to develop, uh, take like the, the very best cotton in the world, Sapima, right? Which is the most traceable and most ethical cotton out there today because most of it's grown in the United States. It's also, um, uh, they can literally track it down to a DNA a, uh, level where you can see which farm it came from in California, Arizona. And so it's the most secured, notable cotton in the world, but it's also the most the most smooth and, and the longest staple cotton in the world. So we started with that, um, but then we figured out a way to take jade stone, the mining waste from the Taiwan mines, and seafood waste in the form of crab shells, and pulverize them down to a microscopic level, put them into a viscose process that's closed loop. And instead of using trees for cellulose, we're taking scrap cotton from the floors of the spinning mills in China. 
and we're making a viscose yarn that's all from regenerative materials. And so jade stone, food waste, and scrap cotton waste turned into a viscose yarn that it took us, again, two years to develop. But the, pro the properties of this, uh, these ingredients literally starts to deliver a whole different level of performance. And so the jade stone in itself is actually has, uh, when you touch the fabric, it has a coolness to it. And so it actually can cool your skin up to five degrees cooler naturally because jade does not conduct heat. So it has a natural thermal regulation uh, quality to it. Jade stone is also anti-inflammatory and increases blood circulation. So it has some wellness benefits as well. And again, all of this is in the microscopic level of the yarn. So none of this washes out. It's actually built into the yarns and the fabric. The crab shells, which is, you know, chitinin is what the technical term would be, is the main ingredient in beauty products. So most people might know, know it from that, but it actually provides um, anti-odor uh, or antimicrobial benefits. It's odor resistant naturally. Uh, it also uh, increases uh, the hydration of the skin and the healing of the skin naturally. So it has other wellness benefits as well. But the thing we talk a lot about is the jade stone keeps you cool and the crab shells basically keep you fresh. You can wear, you can wear our shirts for several days on end uh, with no odor. And it actually decreases the need to wash the garment every time you wear it. So it actually uses less water by nature of the fact that it doesn't uh, collect odor. Um, so those two, those two properties blended together with the viscose, uh, in addition to viscose being very soft and smooth, you get this cotton Zapima feel with cooling and antimicrobial benefits that's really re very, very comfortable. And then we blend it in. The only synthetic thing in the whole garment is 100% re recycled spandex, which really allows you to have more comfort. And right now there's no natural uh, real substitute for spandex. So we just went with recycled. And uh, in the end of the day, this is a 95% biodegradable product. And uh, even down to the buttons, which uh, we use mother of pearl. So this is a this is a luxury men's item. It is, uh, you know, we're distributed in, you know, the best men's retailers in the U.S. and a very limited distribution this year. Uh, and so far, um, this is the kind of thing that people try them on and then they come back and buy four or five. You know, it's just a, it just has this visceral reaction because people can't believe it's this comfortable. And then when we tell them it happens to be half regenerative recycled materials and it's a more sustainable product, then people are like, you know, really, really shocked that it could be that nice when you tell them how we how we made it. And so the ingredients is really the, the key in what we're doing. But in addition to that, um, we, we made it all in the simple form of a polo shirt. It's one of the most utilitarian items in a men's closet. And so we started here because everybody wears them. And it's also a product that uh, the luxury market really likes. Uh, golf market really likes. And if you know the golf market, it's all polyester. And so this is the, the aim of Hypernatural is really to be the antidote to polyester and prove that you can have natural performance done in a sustainable way, but also a very luxurious product. And so as we sort of go forward a little bit, you know, we, we have, we've developed this icon around the magpie uh, and, and the magpie are, is our totem. And, and our totem is really the symbol of the genius of nature. Like if you really work with nature versus against it, you can actually do incredible things. And so our whole ethos and approach to the business going forward is we started with polo shirts, but we'll eventually do anything that touches your skin. And we're gonna focus a lot more on bringing benefits, not just of comfort, but also wellness over time. And you can imagine a lot of the categories that we'll go into. So all of this is proprietary product and technology that we've developed. And you know we've launched, like I said, this year with a real simple approach to, we're doing four styles, two fits, two fabrics, one product story. That's it. We don't do anything else that's not sustainable. It's really, really hyper-focused. And the idea with that is it's all about the material and the fabric. We don't need a bunch of stuff. We just, we're just making really nice product that people would wanna own multiples of. Uh, and so these are just some of the images of what we launched with, uh, you can see, it's pretty clean, very modern, um, but we also do have a lot of color and, and we're, 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 we've, we've done Okatex uh, certified 100 dyes, blue sign approved. Uh, we have GS uh, recycled standards. We have uh, uh, warp um, 
uh, fair labor labor practices. So we've kind of done all the things that we could possibly do to make this the lowest impact product. But at the end of the day, we're, we're making it better through nature. And the idea is that there's there's zero percent polyester in this garment, but it has performance. There's no chemical harmful chemical dyes or anything that you put on your skin that you wouldn't want to absorb into your body. Um, 95% biodegradable. We have one of the only 100% recycled spandexes in the world called Creora. And at the end of the day, we, we're making products at the lowest possible impact we can make them, uh, but nothing's perfect yet. So as we go forward, at some point, we want to be 100% biodegradable. At some point, we want to use all natural dyes, but these are all things that we'll eventually um, have to work our way towards. So, so far, uh, it's been a great start. And, uh, you know, I just appreciate you guys let me share a little bit about it. Absolutely. I also wanted to point out just the packaging, you know, it's really minimal and this is what each shirt comes in. And I love that it says Petro is retro, nature is now. Of course, it's made out of paper. Uh, there's no unnecessary crap uh, when you open it up, which I loved. But, um, you know, in our household, we were so surprised at actually how cooling the shirt is when you put it on. I had never heard of Jade Stone as a fabric before we met with you, Chris. And similar, if those of you out there have like eucalyptus sheets, et cetera, and you get that cooling feeling as soon as you lay in the bed, that's that constant feeling that you get when you wear the shirt. Uh, and so uh, we are like fans for life. We said it's gonna be hard to go back to any like typical golf shirts or like PK cotton after wearing this shirt. It's so, so good. Uh, but you know, guys check out his website too. We think it's such a beautiful website. Um, it really just gets you into that storytelling mode of, of how you can be so sustainable yet luxurious, uh, at the same time. And Chris, thank you for taking us through your journey. We are cheering you on. We're really excited and, uh, perfect father's day gift coming up, right? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So uh, we're hopefully that between Father's Day and the golf season starting, we'll be making a lot of new friends. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we're small, we're startup and we're self-funded and we're doing it that way just so we can keep it clean and pure. So hopefully we'll see a lot more this season out there. Uh, Chris, Gwen is asking in the chat what the weight of the fabric is. I know it's super lightweight from wearing it. I just don't know the specifics. Yeah. So there's two fabrics. One is uh, a jersey that... Uh, uh, that's about 165 grams. So it's very light. We call it a featherweight. Uh, I think the one, Michael, you might have on is our micro piquet, which is a little heavier. It's about 235 grams. But it, the, the piquet is so fine, you almost have to look closely to know that it's a piquet. I would have even known, uh, yeah. Yeah, and the idea is that you have two shirts that you could really wear anywhere, whether it be on a golf course or underneath a suit, or just you could literally wear it an entire weekend on a trip, you'd be, you'd be fine. So the idea is that, you know, if you give fewer, better things, you know, these are things that will last and then they have a lot of different places in your wardrobe. And uh, and that's why, again, we start with polo shirts. We're going to have t-shirts and other things like that coming out eventually, but that's not uh, where we wanted to start. Cool. And before we uh, jump to the other links today, where can we purchase some Hypernatural if we'd like? Sure. So uh, hypernaturalstyle.com obviously is, is our site, but we're on uh, Nordstrom now. We just went up on Nordstrom's this week. So that's an easy place. Uh, we're in Fred Siegel in LA. We're also be at Whitmore in LA. Uh, we're at Curio in Miami Beach. Uh, so just your, your better boutiques for men's. Uh, we're, we're, we'll be uh, <clears throat> eventually, uh, we'll probably be in Europe and Asia, but right now we're only in the US. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today, Chris. We're excited. Oh, thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. All right. We're going to jump into the rest of the links for the April show and tell. We're going to start off with Hannah. Hey, Hannah. Hey, everyone. I'm Hannah. Um, I'm the senior strategist uh, for Intimates and Swim here at FS. I um, just want to kind of piggyback on to what Michael was saying. Just thanks for sharing your story with us, Chris. It's just so amazing and inspiring. And I just Love those added benefits of the natural materials, but definitely will be sharing with my friends and family. Um, so for my first link, I wanted to share um, that the new trailer for the Wes Anderson movie was released just last week. Um, so this new movie is called Asteroid City. Um, it's shot in Spain and has a sci-fi twist. Um, so the plot is about a junior stargazer um, convention. Um, which is then spectacularly disrupted um, by world changing events. And um, we've got the trailer here. I think it's only a couple of minutes if we want to take a peek. 
Sure, I'm actually going to stop share really quickly because I forgot to do the correct sound. Bear with me. Okay, here we go. All right. Hannah, can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. You're not here. We're not there. The car exploded. Come get the girls. I have to stay here with Woodrow. I'm not the chauffeur. I'm the grandfather. Where are you? Asteroid City, Farm Route 6, Mile 75. Last train. To your stargazers and space cadets. Each year we celebrate Asteroid Day, commemorating September 23rd, 3007 BC, when the arid plains meteorite made Earth impact. <laughs> Holy Toledo, that's Mitch Campbell. You're very good in the one about the tramp in the brothel who Thank gets you. amnesia and Thank you. a pediatrician. You were very awesome. Actually, maybe my favorite character ever. I don't know why nobody else liked it. Oh. What do those pulses indicate? What? Oh, the beeps and blips? We don't know. Some of our information about outer space may no longer be completely accurate. Anyway, there's still only nine planets in the solar system as far as we know, Billy. Except now there's an alien. What's happening now? I don't know. I don't like the way that guy looked at us. The alien. How did he, how did he look? Like we're doomed. Maybe we are. I've just informed the president. How long can they keep us in Asteroid City legally? The world will never be the same. That's an alien doing jumpy jacks. That's an alien in a top hat. What's out there? The meaning of life. Maybe there is one. Are you married? I'm a widower. But don't tell my kids. You're saying her mother died three weeks ago. Let's say she's in heaven. Which doesn't exist for me, of course, but you're Episcopalian. In my loneliness, I learned to give complete and unquestioning faith to the people I love. I don't know if that includes you, but it included my daughter and your four children. Sometimes I think I feel more at home outside the Earth's atmosphere. Oh, wow. Me too. They're strange, aren't they? They're children. Compared to normal people. Yes, that's correct. It's true. Mm -hmm. Freight train, freight train, going so fast. Freight train, freight train. Going so fast, I don't... I do a nude scene. You want to see it? Huh? Did I say yes? You didn't say anything. Uh, I meant yes. My, my mouth didn't speak. I mean, I feel like how much more Wes Anderson can, can Wes Anderson be, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's beautiful. Just such a, you know, fun, fun cast and just vis visually beautiful as well. Um, so my second link is actually related to this uh, trailer as well. And some film fans might already know about this account on Instagram. Um, but the Color Palette Cinema, they share stills from movies with little um, palettes beneath. And as we were kind of seeing in that trailer, just has such a beautiful level of hues or sun washed and gorgeous. So um, just wanted to kind of share this um you know how they pull out the colors it's really beautiful it is the colors are so good i'm waiting for him to make a horror movie next now that he's done sci-fi with this <laughs> exactly <laughs> thank you hannah good shares thank you all right uh next up are actually my links guys i'm michael vp of menswear in case you didn't know so the first link i want to share um is a great new york times article about um one of the new shows, and I don't think it was shared, I wasn't here last month, but Extrapolations is a new Apple TV Plus show that actually internally we shared during mo our most recent pitch day for the season. Um, and I know a bunch of us have been watching it and I've been super inspired by kind of the aesthetic, but I'm always really fascinated by costume design as I'm sure many of you are. So this article actually interviewed the three costume designers about, um, you know, how they did what they did as far as what clothes look like in this climate changed future. So just wanted to read a few highlights as I scroll through and, and just show some images. Um, it, for those of you that don't know, the show is basically exploring what life will look like in the next 50 years based on the current, current climate change modeling. Um, the show imagines a messy future in which deadly heat waves, sea level rise, and, and species extinction shape our health relationships and, of course, our clothing. Um, lots of people are in the show. Meryl Streep, Kit Harington, Sienna Miller, Toby McGuire goes on and on and on and on. Um, it's really, really well done. Um, and so there are a few kind of, you know, 
wearable tech futuristic moments in it, like a smartwatch that lets you change your eye color. But what was so cool is that most of the costuming actually looks like clothing that we would wear today, which is something that I was a huge fan of. We always kind of say never underestimate, you know, the effect of now in the future. So, you know, obviously we're not all riding around in spaceships and eating capsules for our meals. Like there's obviously some sort of reality based in the future. So all three designers relied heavily on finding clothes in thrift stores over buying brand new pieces and they use them to create looks that feel like they belong in the future. In one episode, they have a lot of nine binary corporate looks, uh, which were created using Jean-Paul Gaultier vintage and Vivian Westwood, um, which is super cool. Um, but I love that they asked Katie Riley, who's the head costumer, um, you know, about the kind of overall aesthetic. And she said, we knew it shouldn't look like the Jetsons. We're not all gonna be wearing silver jumpsuits in the future. Um, we wanted to make it so it wasn't too costumey while being heightened and interesting and relatable and really driving into the story. Um, and she knows that in the future, just like now, everyone is different and not everyone's gonna be wearing the same thing. Um, one of the episodes take place in India and uh, it's so hot that it's illegal to go outside during the day. So she was thinking, how does clothing age differently when you're in such a crazy conditions? We imagine the villagers hanging clothing out during the day and the sun stripping away the color. You can see the lines from where it was hanging on the clothesline all bleached out, like storytelling details that emphasize how harsh the climate is. Um, also in one episode, they had a school class of young children and they designed uniforms that had heat protection because a lot of them had heat sickness. So the clothing has a sensor on it that actually lights up when you're reaching your heat limit for the day. Um, so it's just really cool things like that. Um, also talking about the silhouettes and tech, um, they talked about the textiles that would be available in the future. And I thought this was super cool. And I know Nia on our materials team would definitely agree with this, but they imagine that in the future, cotton is going to be basically like diamonds um, because they imagine that cotton fields are going to be more extinct because water is going to be so much scarce. And so eventually those natural fibers will probably be too expensive for the common consumer. Silk and wool will be very high priced at some point. Plant derived fabrics might disappear and be replaced by manufactured fabrics completely. Um, so I think all of it's super cool. You can read through the article at your leisure. Uh, one thing that I loved is that it is a show about climate change. So they were very conscious of that and they tried to use um, clothing that they could get that they could source from vintage stores, et cetera. They thrifted um, because they wanted to be ecologically minded uh, time-wise and budget-wise when they were making this, this show. But check out the show if you kind of love that vibe, that aesthetic. Um, it's really, really well done. And then on that same kind of uh, plane, um, and this is really great to, to talk about because this is very in the news this week. Uh, as you know, they announced the five astronauts that will be orbiting around the moon for the first time in like 50 years next year. Uh, this specifically is for the year after 2025 when we are going to put astronauts back on the moon. So NASA has premiered their new space suit. Uh, and believe it or not, this is the first time that they've actually reconsidered it in 40 years. Um, so unlike what you've seen with uh, SpaceX and Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin, these are spacesuits that are gonna actually be worn on the moon, not just orbiting the moon or, or in the universe. Um, and so I wanted to kind of show you what they were doing with it, which is really interesting. This is kind of a close up here. The suit is a lot more flexible than past uh, iterations that we had, it in, uh, allowing for increased mobility. And also it's adjustable to account for gender and size differences. Uh, they've changed the colors up a lot, whereas they used to use a lot more white 40, 50 years ago, now they're using a lot more black. You cannot use silver, unfortunately, for any kind of space suits, which I found interesting because it basically um, reflects the sun rays in a negative way that can blind the astronaut. Um, so uh, the initial order that NASA has spent on the new, these new spacesuits, believe it or not, is about $229 million, um, which is crazy. But there's a lot of philosophy that you can read. It's a long article about, you know, why they put so much effort into these spacesuits. But I really loved this quote, and I just wanted to read it to you. This comes from, um, this comes from a man who's the head of architecture at MIT, and he wrote a book called Spacesuit Fashioning Apollo. 
And he says, he describes the spacesuit that we use as really less a piece of clothing than a very small building or very small spacecraft. It's because the spacesuit is, quote, the costume for the drama we project into space, the way that we put ourselves into the heavens. And I thought that was so beautiful, so well said. Um, but you can read through there and kind of see what all the technical aspects are. It's very interesting. And then my last link of today is something that um, I think is kind of the antithesis of ASMR, which anyone that works at FS knows that really freaks me out anyway. This really freaks me out. I can tend to be a little claustrophobic. Uh, this is not a new room, but for some reason it's getting a lot of press over the last week. But Microsoft has uh, created in 2015 what the Guinness Book of World Records says is the quietest place on the planet. And let me just tell you why and what that means. Um, it's fascinating. So it's called the anechoic chamber. Anechoic uh, basically is uh, means without echo. It took two years to design this space, uh, but they found from ultra sensitive tests performed that the average background noise reading is negative 20.35 decibels which is really quiet. Uh, there are six layers of concrete and steel. It's completely disconnected from the surrounding building. There's vibration damping springs situated below. There's fiberglass wedges all on the floor, ceiling, and walls, which break up sound waves before they even have a chance to um, bounce back into the room. Only a few people since 2015 have been able to withstand being in the room for uh, more than an hour. And let me tell you why. So after a few minutes, uh, you will already start to hear your heartbeat. A few minutes after that, you can hear your own bones grinding and your blood flowing. Um, environments that we think are ultra quiet are typically louder than the human hearing threshold, which is around zero decibels. So a library reading room, for example, is usually 40 decibels. So with no sound from the outside world coming in, this is what happens to your body. The total and utter silence will gradually turn into an unbearable ringing in your ears. This will lead to you losing your balance due to the lack of reverberation in the room, which will impair your spatial awareness. So it says, when you turn your head, you can hear that motion. You can hear yourself breathing and it sounds super loud. You can hear your bones. It's insane. I would never, ever, ever, ever want to be in this room, but I did find it really fascinating, uh, the logistics that went into it. Uh, so I just wanted to share that. I know everyone's freaking out from that, uh, as I am. So uh, those are my links. I'm going to pass it on to Nia. Hey, Nia. Thanks, Michael. They've got to do a horror movie about that. That would Ugh. be so terrifying. <laughs> no, corporate horror. Right. Okay. So hi, everyone. I'm Nia Silva. I'm the materials director at FS. So for my first link here, I have something that's a bit outside of my wheelhouse. It's related to sports. And while I'm I usually I'm a general fan of sports here and there, I'm by no means a sports expert, uh, which might be the reason why I was kind of fascinated by this. So I wanted to share this first article that Michael's kind of scrolling through um, just details how sports leagues and broadcasts have been seeing declines in young viewership over the past few years. And analysts feel the change comes as people are, of course, turning away from traditional TV viewing, instead towards social media, video games, and streaming platforms. And if they do engage with sports, more often now it's limited to highlight reels or snippets as opposed to a full game. And this trend is definitely something that was, of course, accelerated by the pandemic. So now sports broadcast industries and leagues are having to explore new means of growth for their key demographics, but especially for younger demographics. Um, so you can hop to the next link, Michael. I have another article um, yeah, linked here. And this just details some potential focus areas that businesses are exploring from the super technical camera equipment drones that they're developing that can capture the game in new angles. Um, also, this idea of social interactive viewership that they detail in the article is really fascinating, as well as augmented reality, um, which leads me to my final link today. Michael, you can jump to the last one. So with Disney, um, there we go. Perfect. Um, so Disney and the U.S. National Hockey League, also known as the NHL, They've recently joined forces to begin to kind of reinvent the way younger audiences interact with sports broadcasts 
with their debut of this first ever fully animated uh, game telecast. So it took place last March and the entire game was presented with motion capture announcers and big city green characters. And the Big City Greens um, is an actual, is a popular um, animated series. It's actually Emmy winning. I wasn't familiar with it before this, but it's, it looks super amazing. Um, and of course we know Disney has owned ESPN for you know many years. So the pairing makes sense, but I just thought it was so fascinating to see these announcers, these commentators as you know these, these um, animated um, characters. Um, and they're using the facial recognition tech, as you can see in the image, they're wearing these wearable suits that kind of capture their motion. And it's all in an effort to kind of prep and prime this new generation of, you know, young viewers so that they're into, you know, kind of get into this world of sports broadcasting and are interested. I think there's a tiny clip. If you scroll down, Michael, um, or maybe it was... I do not see it. Maybe at the top. If not, it's fine. The, the images kind of do. Oh, right here. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I think it's like a minute. We can just quickly play it. Like, we're definitely like doing something that, you know, nobody in the sports world has done. We set up 43 motion capture cameras here in Studio Z. Our talent will be wearing motion capture suits. You will see instead of Drew and Kevin uh, in human form, they will be cartoons for the entire game. We're trying to find ways to bring in younger fans, newer fans, fans that might be fans of hockey. This type of technology is a way to make them you know, cartoon characters. It has a little bit of a feel of a video game to it as well. And those things combined are something that interests the younger generation. So yeah, overall, I just found it so fascinating to kind of this idea of like animating things and trying to get kids interested in things that they would typically find boring. But yeah, that's all for me today. It's a really good topic. And, you know, baseball um, here in the U.S. is one of the sports that's really suffering from a decreased amount of interest and viewers, especially with Gen Zers. And so they're trying to do more things to speed up the game. They're, you know, yeah. doing, putting timers into effect for pitches and other things like that. But um, yeah, it's a really relevant topic for sure. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Nia. Uh, Michelle. Hi, everybody. I'm Michelle. I'm new. I'm a materials intern since January. Um, I'm excited to share my first link, which is about the brand Stella McCartney and their new release of the iridescent bio sequence jumpsuit that was worn by model Cara Delevingne in the latest edition of Vogue, which I actually have the Vogue, the physical copy with me, um, but they don't, um, in the edition, they don't really talk about the bio sequence and it doesn't do it justice. So um, at the top, there is a video, very short, that we could watch. The second that Cara called me and told me she was shooting the cover for American Vogue, I had to let her into my huge secret about Radiant Matter. It's a project we've been working on for a while now, exclusively at Stella McCartney. In Vogue, it was the perfect place to showcase this incredible scientific solution to all of the huge impact on microplastics on finally see it on someone like Cara in American Vogue shot by Annie Woods. It's like incredible. I'm so proud. Yeah, so Stella McCartney partnered with biomaterials company called Radiant Matter. Each of the bio sequence is made from renewable polymer cellulose extracted from trees. And it also has like a natural property that still allows light to reflect. So it can still have that sequence sparkle. However, conventional sequins are petroleum based plastic, kind of like what Chris mentioned before, which can be harmful for people and the environment. So just overall, I thought it was really cool to see high end brands provide style and athletic and aesthetic without actually compromising sustainability, which is cool. And my second link um, is about a company called Romoto and their take on glamping. If you are maybe unfamiliar with the words glamping, it's glamorous camping. And there's a video at the top that just kind of shows how it maneuvers. Hold on, it's moving slow. There we go.
Do you want to talk over it, Michelle? Yeah. Um, so I thought this was amazing just because the original concept of the design was revolved around a USB flash drive and how a USB flash drive swings around easily. This was a futuristic idea thought first in 2012, but then the first prototype actually came out in 2018, six years later. And then only now in 2023, is it actually ready for market? So the trailer has everything you could need like storage space, bedroom, a deck, a bathroom. It's supposed to fit comfortably for people. And I just thought that this was also a cool thing to share just because it's new to the market and now you can go camping in style. And I thought this was a really fun way to just travel and if you wanna take a nice road trip. And there's some more pictures at the bottom that shows like the inside, very spacious. Very nice. It's ready for market. And yeah, that's all I have for you guys today. Thanks for listening. Thanks for uh, sharing. It's super cute. I love the curved uh, shapes. Yeah. Sorry for all the pop-ups. Design Bloom has the worst user experience sometimes. All right. Thanks for sharing. Uh, now we have Hago. Hey, Hago. Hi. Hi, everyone. My name is Melissa Hago. I'm the VP of Beauty and Wellness here at Fashion Snoops. Um, my first link is this beautiful cover of um, the oldest ever cover model of Vogue Philippines. Um, I'll actually, I saw Nico had the same link. So I don't know, Nico, maybe since I have a few, if you wanted to speak to this too. Yeah, I'll let you, I'll, I did, you probably put it first. So I'm gonna let you say whatever you wanted to say about it and I can just add if, if Okay, that's awesome. Cool. No, I mean, I was just gonna, yeah, say that. I know I've been seeing it everywhere. It's such a stunning, beautiful cover. Um, like I said, she's 106 years old. She's a tattoo artist, I believe. So um, she lives in the mountain village of Buscalan, which is about, uh, I think, 15 hours north of Manila. So, you know, it's super interesting, especially in the beauty world, as we continue to speak about things like defying ageism and just, you know, the beauty of aging and stuff like that. I thought it was just such a timely cover. And I love that she's all tattooed up, too, because it kind of brings in some of also that, you know, ancient tradition and stuff like that. So, I mean, that's what I, I have to say. And I, I love that. I know we just have the cover photo here. I think there's a bit more, but yeah, feel free to add it as well. You know. Yeah, Michael, if you, sorry, I don't want, I, sorry about jumping around. Do you want to click the, the Vogue art link that's in mine? Yeah, so you got can it. see some more photos of it. Um, yeah, all I would add is just that, you know, this art form of tattooing is, really common across Austronesian and Pacific cultures. In the Philippines, it was suppressed by Spanish colonization. And actually, when the Spanish arrived in the Philippines, they initially called Filipinos pintados, which means painted ones in Spanish. Um, and, uh, you know, according to some of the interviews that anthropologists have done, uh, Wang Odd started doing this, as Melissa said, when she was 16, and she was the first and only female um, ta traditional tattoo artist of her time. And she would go to different villages and imprint these sacred symbols on to individuals who are about to cross a certain threshold in their lives. What's interesting about the Vogue cover story is that it talks about how this image of the Kalinga tribes as quote unquote bloodthirsty savages by colonizers has really been perpetuated by this colonial photographer named Dean Worcester, who published in 1912 photos of the tribe in National Geographic. And he described them as like exotic and terrifying. And his work was really kind of an attempt to justify North American control of the Philippine islands. Uh, additionally, when Catholic missionaries came and built schools in Kalinga, a lot of the village people were made to cover up their arms with long sleeves, and being tattooed became a kind of point of shame uh, for Kalinga people who were, you know, in the city and um, moving around in more like modern spaces. Um, so I just think it's really powerful to see, you know, the Philippines have their own space on the Vogue platform. Vogue Philippines only opened in 2022. Um, and, you know, Vogue is, has become this global purveyor of what is considered beautiful. And for the editorial team to place Wang Odd on the cover with her beautiful tattoos, after, you know, so many centuries of oppression of this practice, I think is really powerful and beautiful. So great. I only wish we could have people like this on the cover of our Vogues here in the U.S. 
would be so much better. Yeah. Thank you, Nico. Uh, we added so much to that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so the next one is I actually recently went to St. Lucia and um, I was able to be part of this project cacao, um, which is part of the Hotel Chocolat. Um, and they have a bunch of the hotels or, or the chocolate, um, what's it called, store around the world, but this is the only place where they actually have the project. So they have different things, experiences like tree to bar, bean to bar. So you actually get to go to the jungle see cacao and its raw form, which, you know, again, being in the beauty industry, it's so nice to kind of see and touch and experience an ingredient that we've talked about for so long. Um, and then we got to make our own chocolate, um, which again, I will never look at chocolate the same. That was so hard. It was <laughs> work. We had that, um, it, it took a lot of arm power, <laughs> shoulder power. So it was just to me such a, I don't know, humbling experience to be able to like walk you know the jungle where the plant came from see how they harvest it and then be able to make the chocolate and eat it at the end so such a beautiful place um they have a restaurant where they do cacao drink cacao food so it's just a nice way of kind of like learning about something being part of this agri-tourism experience you know and then kind of you know have it again from beginning to end experience so i, I truly enjoyed it so if anyone's ever in St. Louis, chef, for any reason, definitely check out this Project Chocolat. That's so cool. They made you work for your chocolate then. Yeah, yeah. And plus you have to do hiking, you have to walk around the jungle. So you really want that chocolate at the end. <laughs> um, my next one is, I know, you know, we've been talking a lot about inclusivity when it comes to clothes and sizes and beauty. I thought this was a little bit different than what I've seen. This is um, Dove Brazil. They created larger beach chairs for bigger bodies. Um, and then I think, you know, it's, it, it was just, you know, whether you have larger hips or something like that. So, um, I just thought, you know, as we continue to see how inclusivity is kind of changing, I thought, again, this was really interesting. And I know, you know, they saw that different people, 50% of people, even with disabilities, stop going to the beach due to the lack of amenities. So I thought it was really interesting to kind of cater um, to people, whether it be, you know, body type or disability. So I, I just thought it was really neat to mm -hmm. see shifts and things like this that aren't just like clothes or beauty products. And then for my last one, so I'm in Florida, so I'm always in this kind of summer mood, <laughs> hence the beach chairs. And then um, that's why I put on my jacket today. I uh, love this because uh, I'm in Tampa, but love Miami. So I just love this whole Miami core aesthetic that we're seeing on TikTok. It's very pastel, very golden girl. Um, you know, there's this, again, there's all this like really kitschy coastal design. Um, I'm also 80s baby. So I love all the kind of like 80s reference. Um, so yeah, I just, they don't have as much here. Yeah, they just have the video, but I personally just like love this trend. And again, as we kind of move from spring to summer, you know, just kind of, especially with the Barbie trailer also coming out, even though I know it's a California thing, it still has this kind of like neon, flamingos, you know, um, art deco. So just kind of, I love this trend. <laughs> of course you would. Even when Hago worked uh, and lived in New York with the rest of us in the dead of winter, her vibe was summer. So I know it took me a while to buy a real winter coat. I would just layer like blazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's all. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Nico's already shared the Vogue Philippines cover. So I'm going to move on to his next article. Yeah, so my next article is just a link to uh, my current read right now. I, If you've joined before, I always like to share what I'm currently reading. It always ends up informing somehow the kind of cultural forecast that we're doing at FS. So this month, I'm reading The People Who Report More Stress, which is a short stories collection by the author Alejandro Varela. And I just saw this author do a reading and uh, a talk at a bookstore in the Lower East Side called P&T Knitwear. Um, they don't sell any knitwear. I'm assuming that it used to be a knitwear manufacturing building, but it's a great place. They have like an atrium that's kind of this cool terraced event space. And they also have um, a cafe in the bookstore. 
or so. I just went there for the first time. But anyway, the the writer Alejandro Varela is also the author of The Town of Babylon, which was shortlisted for the National Book Award last year. It was his debut novel. He actually comes from a public health background and worked in public health for a really long time. And something that he said in um, the talk about why he switched over to writing fiction was because, and he actually called it switching from policy to poetry. He still considers himself a public health worker, but he says that simply his medium has changed and he, uh, from you know doing policy to writing books and that this more storytelling and poetic way of um, telling public health messages um, was a more creative way for him to relay uh, what he cares about. So I think that this um, review from Publishers Weekly is really great and summarizes it pretty well. They say that the, t the people who report more stress is a searing collection about gentrification, racism, and sexuality. Varela provides invaluable insight on the way stress impacts the characters' lives and how they persevere. Yeah, so essentially, this is a collection of these interconnected stories that are exploring the anxieties of people who uh, retreat into themselves while living on the margins, acutely aware of the stresses that modern life takes upon the body and the body politic. So I'm about halfway through the book right now. I just got it on Sunday, but I really resonate with a lot of the internal dialogues of his characters um, that they go through while navigating American life with these intersecting oppressed identities. It kind of reminds me of the ways that I think and operate in everyday life. You know, for example, like when his characters are in public spaces, uh, in his writing, he kind of shows how they uh, retreat into themselves and have these internal thoughts about, oh, you know, is this person looking at me because like they think I shouldn't be in the store? Do they think I'm stealing something? All those kinds of internal thoughts about microaggressions in everyday life. So yeah, I would highly recommend if you haven't read this, but also his novel, The Town of Babylon. I love that. And Nico, you can see in the chat box, you have a couple of fans of your book club. Um, as always, Nico knows what to read. So. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nico. And last but not least, we're going to end today's webinar with Katie, who is a new member of our team from the women's team. Hi, Katie. Hi, so happy to be here. So I'm the women's retail analyst, and I think we're doing Nike first. Is that what you clicked on? Yes. Yep. So um, super excited. This really caught my eye and I honestly wish they had it when I was in high school and middle school. Um, so for the first time ever, Nike has period proof shorts. So they're bike shorts um, that have technology with a thin liner to ensure both leak free and sweat proof. Um, so the shorts utilize their um, famous dry fit technology, which um, helps wick away stress and keep you feeling dry while being active. Um, and they state that these shorts help um, protection, but they also use, um, say to use original methods of protection um, and use this as a backup, as an added layer while being active, playing sports or doing whatever. Um, so what I found really interesting was this quote also from um, towards the bottom of the article saying that we learned that by age 14, girls are dropping out of sports twice the rate of boys. And by 17, an age at which most have gone through puberty, 51% will have quit. And although they know that, you know, there's many factors that probably go into that, this is definitely one of them. And I'm so happy to see that they brought this to the market. Um, you know, it really supports women's health and young women's health and gives them back freedom worry-free, you know, added layer, and it's comfortable most of all, you know, um, up at the top there, they show some pictures. So it comes in blue gray, like a dusty blue gray and a black. Um, and I love that it comes in bike shorts because not only can you wear them while playing sports, you can just wear them anywhere since bike shorts are such a trendy and cute item anyway. So um, I love that you can wear it anywhere and not just, you know, while playing sports, but I loved this article. Um, and I think it also ties in well to the topic of women's health. I want to mention our Intimates um, webinar that was just hosted last week by our Intimates team, which presented the future of intimate trends, um, as well as impact on women's health, specifically focused on self-care. Um, that's also available to watch. So that also ties in nicely, but yeah, super excited they came out with this and I want to try it. Okay, the second one is 
Ralph Lauren. So they debut their in-store crypto payments and NFT gifts in Miami, which was really cool um, and super revolutionary, I thought, and innovative that cryptocurrency is really going mainstream um, in the fashion industry, starting with Ralph Lauren um, in Miami. So just to review digital currencies where monetary transactions are fulfilled online and not tied to a government banking institution. And an NFT is a digital asset uh, meaning like a drawing, a picture, music that is tied to cryptocurrency through an authentic certificate. So this is a concept store um, in Miami's um, design district where they will now accept merchandise transactions and crypto payments. Um, so they carry luxury Ralph Lauren um, men's and women's labels, as well as like exclusive items like bags and stuff that you can only get there. Um, as well, they so they're tapping into Miami's Web3 presence among the residents. Web3 is a future version of the internet with um, foundations in cryptocurrencies where there isn't one sort of controlled power over the internet um, rooted in Bitcoin and things like that. So um, they're big like marketing PRs that they're partnering with um, Pool Suite members. Pool Suite's a radio music provider of like all things summer songs. And they received a gift and a, a gift NFT, which is shown right there, um, partnered poolside with Ralph Lauren. And this grants access into a VIP event at a private Miami luxury um, estate for like a poolside party in April. It welcomes influencers, community members and stuff like that. Um, so excited to see like TikToks and things like that from that um, party. But I thought that this, uh, you know, article was really influential and really cool. And um, I think Miami is the perfect location to test this new concept as they have like a really large presence in, crypt in the crypto community um, with like conferences being held there, like Bitcoins, conferences yearly um, and things like that. I really think it's a remarkable feat and truly shows the power of digital currency um, and really it's permeation and adaptation into mainstream culture. And I think retail is the perfect vessel to, you know, have this go into society and, you know, fashion is always innovative and constantly creative. Um, so I thought it was very cool that Ralph Lauren is um, unveiling this. It is cool. I saw this like everywhere on Twitter yesterday and I actually, <laughs> it didn't even occur to me that it was NFT centric. So I'm glad you explained that. So Yes. Yeah, I thought it was really neat. Perfect. Thanks, Thank Katie. You. Of course. Thanks for sharing. Okay, I think that's all of our links. We are ending three minutes early. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. As always, we will follow up with you later this week with all of today's links, as well as a recording of the webinar. And we will see you back here the first Wednesday of May, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll do it all over again. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Happy Easter. Happy Passover to everyone out there. Uh, have a good month. We'll see you in May. Bye-bye.